delighted to be speaking with Professor Anthony Gittens. Professor Gittens is Emeritus Professor of Theology and Culture at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, where he taught from 1984 until 2011. He continues to do consultancy work and offer workshops, seminars, short courses, and retreats in more than 35 countries from Africa to the Pacific. Professor Gittens is the author of 14 books, including the book that we're delighted to be discussing today, Living Mission Interculturally, Faith, Culture, and the Renewal of Praxis, available from the Liturgical Press in 2015. Professor Gittens, it's our honor to be speaking with you. My pleasure. Professor Gittens, in the first chapter of your book, you list 10 theses about intercultural living, and the first of these theses reads, Quote, intercultural living is an intentional and explicitly faith-based undertaking. It is therefore radically different from it simply being a member of an international community and living under the same roof as others, including people of diverse cultures. Professor Gittens, what is it about Christian mission specifically that requires us to embrace an intercultural community life? I think the, uh, the simplest is, is the radical reading of the gospel of inclusivity, inclusion. Uh, mm. In other words, one of the things that I do in the book is to, is to identify uh, multicultural and cross-cultural and various other things. And one of the phrases I use is that multicultural living can be living together separately. Mm. Now, the problem is also that people who belong to international communities of missionaries can also live together separately because they live under the same roof. Uh, they may be multicultural, but they don't really share their cultures. They don't really, um, they're not adequately concerned about the otherness of the other. They don't try to, to work together with differences. Uh, and very often in the past, they have tried simply to assimilate the other into the dominant culture. Mm -hmm. So the reason that we need to be intercultural uh, is that there is no dominant culture for a Christian. Uh, there is no uh, marginalized other, uh, and everybody has to try to work together with differences rather than in spite of the differences. Hmm. Hmm. And would you be willing to speak just very briefly to some of your experiences that led to these insights that you put together in the book? What were the direct experiences underlying this study? Well, there are two kinds of things. One is the kind of the theoretical, because I, I am really a social scientist, uh, and I've been teaching theology for 30 years, uh, and sometimes been concerned about the fact that theologians and, and, and people, you know, with, with, with deep Christian faith, um, realize that they need to become literate in theology, but sometimes assume that they are already literate in culture. Hmm. Uh, and one of my concerns is to try and uh, assist people who are theologically literate to become much more culturally literate. Hmm. The other thing is that, that I spent 10 years in my early uh, life uh, in Sierra Leone, West Africa, um, living with the otherness of the other and realizing that I was the other. Everybody else was at home. I was the one that was other. Uh, and, and trying to learn how not to become assimilated into their life, not to assimilate them into my life, uh, but to live together, as I say, with our differences and to exploit our differences for the common good. Hmm. Professor Kittens, in Chapter 2, you discuss how an intercultural community is different from all of the following, a monocultural community, a bicultural community, a cross-cultural community, and also a multicultural community. How do you define an intercultural community precisely? Well, the, the language uh, is, is kind of shifting a little bit over, over the years. And what has happened is that the word multicultural and intercultural are sometimes used interchangeably. Uh, what I wanted to do is to identify the fact that when we use the word intercultural, we are using it in a theological way. When we use the word multicultural, we're not using it in a theological way. So multicultural is simply the de facto, uh, you know, coming together or living together of people of many different cultures, whereas intercultural is this uh, intentional faith-based uh, response to the challenge of multicultural living. Hmm. 
And I understand, of course, that the book was uh, specifically designed for religious orders and groups of religious. Um, what are some of the elements of the book that you have specifically designed for that, those communities that you might not have included if uh, you're writing to the, the, the general uh, public interested in intercultural living? I, I deliberately wanted to talk to uh, religious communities uh, rather than uh, pr pr producing a, a social science book. I wanted to talk to people who were theologically involved. Uh, and so if I had written it uh, just as a social science book, I wouldn't have been concerned uh, about the theological predispositions of people. But my concern in writing the book, and, and writing it predominantly for religious communities, but not exclusively for religious communities, the book is also addressed to anybody who uh, takes, for example, a multicultural parish community seriously enough uh, to try to do something about uh, achieving some kind of cohesion. But the reason that I wanted to look, look at uh, religious communities particularly is because Religious communities are composed of people who make a specific and intentional commitment to living outside of their own environment uh, for re reasons that are explicitly connected with faith. And so that the, the emphasis in the book uh, is on the fact that if we as religious people, and I don't mean that only in the technical sense of people belonging to religious orders, but if we as religious people who are faith-filled believers cannot live together with our otherness, then who on earth can? Hmm. Professor Gittins, I find this absolutely fascinating. And is there something about uh, Christian theology specifically that enables this intercultural vision uh, as contrasted or compared to perhaps others of the world religions? I'm not in a position really to answer that because I'm, I'm operating very much out of, out of a Christian faith uh, perspective. Uh, I'm sure I could, I could uh, you know, speculate uh, about the challenge uh, of other faiths, but I couldn't do it in any very uh, specific kind of way. I think if, if you start off with something like the Golden Rule, for example, uh, then a lot of what I'm trying to say applies uh, you know, to people of other faiths and other religious traditions. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, in your book, Living Mission Interculturally, Faith, Culture, and the Renewal of Praxis, you introduce a number of very helpful cultural spectrums, including body tolerance, time, individualism and communalism, and high-context and low-context communication. How do cultural differences affect the shaping of our faith? Oh, intrinsically. Uh, I think one of the things that I, uh, I'm interested in trying to uh, identify is the fact that you cannot live your faith except culturally. Culture is the, is the context in which faith is lived. Uh, you know, if, I, uh, if my cultural experience is from uh, some part of southeast Africa, for example, uh, and uh, another person's uh, background and culture is from the northwest of England, then the way they live out their faith is going to be culturally determined and culturally different. Uh, and and one, of the, one of the dangers about uh, international communities uh, is that the dominant culture wants to assimilate the, the minorities uh, into itself. And again, one of the reasons for writing this book is that in the last 40 or 50 years, and I'm thinking specifically now of the, of the Roman Catholic experience, but it's mm. not only the Roman Catholic experience, uh, the, the uh, pool of people who are joining religious communities has virtually dried up in Europe and North America mm. and expanded enormously uh, in Africa and Asia. And the consequence is that the previous dominant culture is no longer dominant. And within the next two decades or so, uh, the dominant cultures will be um, south of the Sahara or south of, south of the equator. Uh, and I don't think many of us have come to terms with that. We still think in terms of Western theology. We still think in terms of Western traditions. We still think in terms of Western dominance and Western uh, um, authority structures and so on and so forth. Hmm. Uh, and one of the things that we really need to address uh, is is the fact that other people uh, than ourselves from those dominant northern uh, climates uh, have their faith and express their faith uh, in different ways from us, which is why I look at something like body tolerance or the way we uh, 
the way we pray, the way we speak, uh, is all culturally determined. Uh, and and that, that uh, cultural expression of our faith needs not only to be acknowledged, but to be luxuriated in and, and to be, and to be uh, expressed by people in their different cultures and learned by people of other cultures so that we can share with each other rather than assimilate others into our own monocultural universe. Is there, so all of these cultural factors, body tolerance, et cetera, affect the way that we live out our faith. That's a fascinating insight and one that seems infinitely complex. Is there any way to anticipate how one's various culture might express itself differently uh, concerning faith? Or must this simply be lived? Must we experience life together and just by the process of simple discovery find how we're expressing our faith differently? Well, it's a combination. Certainly it's a matter of experience, but it's also a matter of real commitment. Uh, the danger is that we can have an experience, uh, but at the same time we bring our ethnocentrism to that experience, and therefore we, we uh, interpret everything through our own preconceived biases. What we need to do is to go into the world of the other, uh, and try and identify some of the cultural impedimenta that we carry with us uh, so that the scales can gradually fall from our eyes. Uh, and that needs to be done very intentionally um, because what we tend to do when we, when we encounter something unfamiliar in another culture uh, is to either repudiate it because it's not familiar to us uh, or simply to, to say that it is not right. Uh, so, so one of the reasons for writing this book is precisely to try and, and help people to become much more sensitized uh, to their own cultural biases and their own need to identify their ethnocentrism uh, and to deal with it in a conscious way as they encounter otherness and other cultural uh, experiences. Hmm. I very much appreciate that reflection, Professor Gittins. Um, at the conclusion of your book, you speak of three types of community. First, a community of invitation. Secondly, a community of inclusion. And also a community of radical welcome. Which of these types describes God's vision for his church on mission? And how would you argue specifically for your position? I, I think the, the answer is fairly straightforward. And the answer is radical inclusion. Uh, you know, in, in Ephesians 2, we have, we have Paul talking about the fact that there has been a major divide between the circumcised and the uncircumcised. But now in Christ Jesus, there is no longer any division. And he says quite explicitly, Jesus has erased the boundary between the two of us. Uh, and then as you read the rest of, of Paul on that topic, and of course the whole of the gospel, Jesus is a person of radical inclusion. He includes the excluded. He goes to the margins. He, he focuses the very center of his mission at the margins and among the marginalized people. Uh, and so radical inclusion has got to be uh, the image that we, that we try to uh, incarnate uh, in our communities, uh, uh, international communities, rather than simply invitation uh, or, or um, kind of a, a, a general kind of hospitality whereby we uh, show hospitality to the others and therefore remain in control ourselves. What we need to do is to, is to be both the insider and the outsider. What we need to do is to be radically inclusive and radically included Professor Giddens, in your decades of teaching anthropology and mission, you've witnessed the modern world come through many changes. How has Christian missions changed during your teaching career, and how do you anticipate that Christian missions will continue to change as you look to the future? Well, here we are at the 500th anniversary of uh, Luther's 95 Thesis, uh, and I think that in my lifetime, uh, our attitude uh, to the Reformation, our attitude to ecumenism, our attitude to uh, interreligious dialogue uh, has changed almost beyond recognition. Uh, when I myself uh, joined a, a religious community, I certainly had an intuition uh, that we had far too many uh, boundaries and far too many strictures and far too many prohibitions uh, uh, in relation to other people who shared one Lord, one faith, and born baptism. Uh, but we're divided by denomination, uh, and we had far too many strictures uh, about the way we treated other people, particularly the Jewish people. Hmm. And in the last 50 years, I think we've come an enormous way 
uh, toward understanding that we must live together and work together and we must uh, trust the goodwill of other people uh, and the commitment of other people to learn more uh, about other people uh, and to see things from uh, not from a simply uh, denominational or, or even uh, even um, a Christian perspective, but from a God's eye view of the world. And I think that, that the, the result of that uh, is, is ongoing. Uh, and my experience uh, of ecumenical cooperation, both here in Chicago and in, uh, in Africa, uh, has been ba- basically life-changing. Hmm. And what is your view, sir? What's causing this ecumenism? Some look to the success of missions overseas and will point to cooperation overseas. Uh, um, others will look to Vatican II, which of course is um, massively significant for spawning so many fruitful dialogues. What is causing this ecumenical movement in the 20th and now 21st century? You know, I think one of the things, and what you say, of course, is, is very true, but I think one of the things is uh, that if we can look into the eyes of another person and see a brother or a sister, then we have a starting point. But if we don't look into the eyes of the other, because as soon as we see the other, we uh, determine that the other is different from us and therefore wrong, then we will do nothing. And I think what's happened in the last 50 years is that we have gradually come to an understanding that we must look at each other and we must understand that everybody is a brother and sister to us, how, however difficult that might be at first blush. Uh, mm-hmm. And we've, we've pursued that. Uh, and, and, and I think we've, we've done it partly because we've, we've become much more um, biblically literate. We've become much more aware uh, of the call, the biblical call uh, to inclusion uh, and to reconciliation. And, and to fraternity and to being our brothers and sisters keepers. That's, that's what's motivated us, I think. Hmm. And Professor Gittens, if I can close with a final question, I've been asking all of the guests on this program this same question, and that is this, what would it mean for the church to be united? How would we recognize this unity, and what can Christians do today to pursue the unity for which Jesus prayed in John 17? I think for as far as Christian unity is concerned, I think my starting point would be the same starting point as Hans Kung, uh, who has said repeatedly, we have one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. That's got to be the starting point. Don't start off by what we don't have together. Don't start off with what divides us. Start off with one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, and then work uh, from that. Uh, and don't be afraid to uh, own our own um, conscientious decisions about what is appropriate for us to do in terms of inclusion and worship uh, with other people. There are all kinds of rules and regulations that say don't do this, don't do that, don't do the other. I think a mature person ought to have the the autonomy uh, before God to stand up and pray with others and worship with others Uh, And instead of saying we can't get together until we all agree, let's get together so that by getting together we may come to agree, not in every single detail, but in the fact that the one Lord, one faith, and one baptism that we share uh, is enough for us uh, to sit at the same table and worship at the same table. Hmm. It's been our honor today to be speaking with Professor Anthony Gittens, Emeritus Professor of Theology and Culture at the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, and also author of the text, Living Mission Interculturally, Faith, Culture, and the Renewal of Praxis. Professor Gittens, thank you so much for speaking with us today. It is my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.